Hi, uh, welcome to episode 14 of Film Tracks. Uh, we have a great show for you, and Andy's going to tell you all about it. We have a very awesome guest today. It is not every day that we have kind of a jack-of-all-trades kind of guy. And um, Rich Ragsdale is here with us. He's a composer, but he's also a great filmmaker, an experimental filmmaker that ranges from stop-motion animation to experimental film with film and also narrative features. So don't go anywhere. We have a great show. Hosting and bandwidth for Trigla is provided by Media Temple. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to episode 14. I can't actually believe it's been 14 weeks since our first episode, um, but we have a great guest with us today. Rich Raxdale is here from KR Productions from Venice, California. Welcome, Rich, to our show. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah. It's, um, I've known Rich for a long time, and it's actually really awesome to have him on the show because, um, as you know, Jesse and I talk about the relationship between sound and image um, in film. But one thing that we do do is have uh, guests that aren't necessarily composers, but also cross the line where they're directors. Um, whether they're, you know, any part of the production process to talk about how soundtracks play a role. So one of the cool things about Rich is that he is a composer, but also a filmmaker. So, Rich, tell us about yourself. Like, where did you come from? I know that you went to the Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about your background and how you started getting into this business. Uh, well, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, you know, nice. with a lot of music big around music me. Big music town, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. big music town. And I studied guitar, actually, a classical guitar in Tennessee. And I went off to Berkeley and decided to, you know, uh, study film scoring and came out here and did the USC program and uh, with, like, uh, Deb Lurie, I think, you know, mm -hmm. who you guys, I think, mm -hmm. had on already. Yeah. So, and, uh, and then I was, you know, tragically unemployed for several years. and we all? Making yeah, exactly. it. Trying make yeah, it. trying to make it. And I ended up uh, working in television. I, I did a lot of sitcoms. I, I scored probably, like, I was working with Jonathan Wolf, the guy that did, like, Seinfeld and uh, Will and & Grace. And I ended up scoring about a dozen or so network TV shows. And, uh, and, and also, so like, uh, some video games, you know, like... Aliens vs. Predator. Ali yeah, Aliens vs. Predator, and No One Lives Forever, Fight Club, you know, a, a bunch of, like, Fox games and Vivendi games. And then um, my brother had started a production company, and around right this time I had just started kind of experimenting with doing films. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the, the cool thing about working in television is that, uh, at the time at least, when you're, you know, especially doing, like, network stuff, she had your summers off, so I got to spend the time, you know, you know, messing around, making experimental films and stuff. And uh, one of them went on to win uh, some awards, and and uh, and then Kevin, my brother, had started a production company, and they were like, "Hey, why don't you uh, come make a make a film with this?" So I'm, <laughs> was, I, that know, a, was that your feature? Yeah, that was my feature, and so and you know, I really had no business making a feature at that point, but it was a <laughs> lot of fun, and, and it turned out great, and. Paramount bought it. And what was it called? It was called The Curse of El Charo, and uh, Showtime and Which Paramount is now bought now like a cult kind of hit. Well, I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, and I scored it too. Of course. So it's like you're one of the kind of the few that direct and score yeah. tend to direct and score your own yeah, stuff for sure. Yeah, like Clint Eastwood, like Clint Eastwood, like Clint Eastwood and and John Carpenter, and Figgis, yeah. Mike Figgis, I think yeah. does that too. Yeah, yeah, um, kind of a, like a specific class of filmmaker. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much how I got into it, and, you know, I kind of stumbled into filmmaking, you know, by accident. Well, you know, I think, I think for those that are watching who don't know your stuff, um, mm -hmm. and now that we're on the topic of Charo, um, I think we should play a clip from the backstory. Oh, okay, cool. Which was kind of like, I mean, it's the intro, just to, to it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's the intro to the film, right? So you're kind of getting, or oh, is it? Well, no, it, it plays later in the film, but yeah, I mean, we, we had to tell the backstory of this monster, you know, the, the, you know, like what the curse was and all that. And, you know, it was a very, very low budget movie and we didn't really have the resources to shoot it. So um, I basically kind of, I went out after 
we had finished production and you know um, did a bunch of animation and, and still photography and stuff and, and assembled it in the style of like a silent film, which I'm pretty obsessed. I'm sort of obsessed with silent and you're, films. And you're so. like very heavily influenced by the original silent oh, film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All the Germans in particular, you know, mm -hmm. Murnau and Fritz Lang and all those guys. They're they're some of my favorite filmmakers. So. Let's check it out. I think for those of you watching, you'll definitely get an idea of the kind of gestation of your aesthetic, at least at that point. You're beginning yeah. filmmaking aesthetic yeah, at exactly, that point. exactly, yeah. Okay, here we go. everything on that you yeah. composed it shot it and all yeah that stuff. how'd you how'd you do the grain did you like drag well, the film through sand or? <laughs> <laughs> sort of you know i mean you know it, it, i shot on like 3200 speed film and stuff so it'd be super grainy and then i also like kind of composited in some some textures mm -hmm. and stuff but you know i just i just had i kind of figured it out as i went mm -hmm. you know because i'm not a real technical guy but so, I mean, did you, do you normally, I mean, did you experiment like crazy with film before you did the sequence or you just kind of shot it and kind of, uh, you know what I mean? Like, did you know well, what kind of look you wanted for it? Well, I knew what kind of look I wanted for it before I started. I mean, I wanted it to look like, I mean, and, and I used a bunch of different formats to kind of get it, but, you know, my idea was, was that it was sort of like, um, it was supposed to emulate like a lost silent film that was on this decaying nitrate and that people had kind of culled together from all these other different weird uh, different weird prints and it was this kind of Frankenstein monster of a film print you know that's cool so it just you know was well you know one thing I noticed about the score in particular is um, I mean the score is awesome and if you guys want to check out uh, more Bridges music go to Spotify. you can definitely find him on Spotify he's all over the place there and this full score for the for El Charo is on there which is awesome um, but one thing I think that's really interesting about the score especially is that the music itself has a hint of like loss. I mean these two people, you know, they're in love but it's like, you know, they're torn apart by whatever and you know this guy is like evil but he wants to love like, you know, ultimately love this girl again. Yeah. And um, I think the opening definitely displays like and I think for me as an early score for you like for a feature this was kind of like when I heard this cue I was like holy cow like there's a lot more depth to mm. this character than I normally thought. That you normally don't see that much in a horror film. You mm -hmm. know, horror scores are very like they're ambient or like, you know, very, yeah. you know, moody. Um, supposed to be scary, which you do get in the, in here, but you don't mm -hmm. normally have like a very memorable theme um, in most horror scores. Whereas like the Curse of El Charo is like very surprising in the opening credits. Yeah, I mean I, I it's funny you say that because I feel like uh, all my favorite like horror scores uh, what are some of your favorite horror scores? Well, it'll probably be like uh, The Omen by Jerry Goldsmith, um, Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, mm -hmm. you know, Psycho. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're all heavily thematic, you know, and 
you know, and I don't, and now, like you say, I mean, really the trend is just, you know, almost sound design music. You know, it's just very little thematic material, a lot of percussion, a lot of like, you know, make jump scare kind of sounds and Drones stuff. Drones and rises. Drones and rises mm -hmm. and, yeah. and booms and It's kind of like sound screeches. design almost. It like yeah. mixes in with the sound design. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's, yeah, and yeah, it's hard to sort of know. And if there's like a love theme, maybe they'll have like a little bit of a melodic thing. But even then, it's usually pretty forgettable. Do you come in with a, uh, do you try to compose with a theme in mind? Like, do you try to, I mean, since you, since you love these very thematic composers, mm -hmm. do you normally start with a theme? Is that kind of like your reference before you start thinking about like soundscape and things uh, like that? Like, do you start thinking about themes immediately? Uh, I mean, it, it depends on, on what the project is, I think. But um, I don't know, because I feel like every time I've ever scored a film or a video game or TV show or anything, I mean, it, it's just, I try to, I mean, it's always different every single time. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have like a, a standard like a st process. A style you know? or a process. Yeah. I mean, maybe if, you know, like all I was doing was scoring, you know, all the time, I would kind of fall into like a, a method, but I don't know. I just, I, d I daydream a lot, I think. <laughs> no, I think, I think, let, let's check out just a little quick 30 seconds or um, a little bit more of this opening from The Curse of El Charo. And you guys that are watching right now, or when you listen to this on the podcast, um, come to your own conclusions, but it's a very... It's a very thematic opening, and it's actually really gorgeous. Um, let's, let's listen to it. So very gorgeous theme. Cool. Talk a little bit about what you did. You, you were just talking about how you ran it through an analog oh, yeah. sound. Well, uh, you know, we recorded a piano in this fellow's living room, and then I, I took both sides, recorded it stereo, and one at a time I ran it through an old MXR analog delay pedal. And and what does that do? What does that? What would that be be used for? A um, guitar mostly, guitar. you know. But so we did a side at a time, and and you know when it. You know, in the picture, there's a part where the, it, you know, it's again done kind of like an old film, and you know it jumps a little bit, and so at that point I would take the, you know, the delay time because we were sending out just the wet signal, and I would just twisted the knob a little bit to make it go blah, 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 like like the analog, like the uh, optical track on an old film is you yeah. know, stretched out and all messed up to kind of so. like go with the, the yeah to, to match the, the the image like the frame jumping and all that. Um. That that's awesome. I, I think that those of you watching, if you want to listen to the rest of that cue, it actually jumps into, I believe, kind of like, it's it seems very analog at the beginning. You mm -hmm. kind of have this analog piano sound, mm -hmm. and then it jumps to this like very explosive, yeah. stereophonic, uh, you know, yeah. like surround kind of. Well, that's the idea. Is it's supposed to sound sort of mono, and then when when it gets horrifying and all the strings come in, we we open it up to like just a, like explodes, a big, yeah, stereo kind of. Um, you guys need to check it out on um, Spotify. Curse of El Charo, Bridge to Ragsdale, check it out. All right. Um, so let's kind of shift gears here a little bit and talk about your recent music video. You do music, you direct music videos. Yeah, I've been directing a lot of music videos lately. So talk about your last, your last one, which the, featured zombies. The one, I mean, it actually just dropped like a day ago. 
and it was for a band called Super Black Market, and it was a you know relatively low budget music video, but you know we got a lot of bang for the buck, and they wanted to do a zombie love story, so we shot a uh, zombie themed music video, you know. And you shot it on digital, and you did. We shot it digitally, but we tried to you know sort of give it a very kind of like nice, uh, especially once the band starts playing like kind of seventies treatment to the look, you know, just a kind of little homage to the George Romero era zombie-ness. Cool. Um, so in terms of, like, how do you, as a, comp like, you're a composer on one hand, so you think musically for a mm. lot of, of, of things. Or you, yeah. so if you see images, you can think about them musically. Um, but when you're given music, is it hard to shift gears and think about the images by themselves? Or how, what, what's your creative, does your creative process change a little bit? No, not really. I mean, I feel like it all kind of comes from the same part of your brain you know and it's it's making a music video is like reverse film scoring it's like instead of writing music to a fixed picture you know where you have to hit certain beats and and you know like cuts and whatever you know and ride the emotional context of the scene you know a music video is the other way around I mean it's like you have this fixed piece of music and you if especially this one is a narrative thing so you know you have to get this narrative within this you know uh, the, you know the the beginning and the ending of the song three minute song three minute order. song yeah exactly yeah. so which is easier do you think which, uh, which is easier i think film scoring is easier than directing <laughs> by, by like a light year you yeah. know you know directing is hard <laughs> you know? but is is very rewarding and lots of fun and it's also the funny thing is like you know composing is very like solitary you know by yourself you're with yeah, yourself yeah, in experience, your mind you know it's like yeah activity and and then directing is you spent, when you're on set, I mean, there's lots of people and you have a crew and it's very social and very, like, aggressive and in the It's a team effort. It is a team effort. And it's also, I mean, you know, there's a lot of pressure, you know, because usually you don't have that much time and you got to get stuff You don't have done. that much money or you're confined yeah. by money. Well, yeah, and just like, time, I mean, it's like if you're, like, the, we shot two days on the zombie video and the first day we're out in the Angeles National Forest, so it was all available light, you know, and uh, it was like, you know, we have this much time to get this done, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's or like, the that's sun's it. Gonna move. The sun's going to go down and we're doomed. And it's you not, know? you don't have to think about that as a composer. You're yeah, just exactly. Like, I can compose whenever yeah. I want to. I mean, they're usually on a film, I mean, there's usually the, 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 the uh, time you have to compose for film seems to be getting more and more compressed these days, you know, because post goes a lot faster now. But, uh, you know, it's still, it's nothing like directing. So At least one, not, not in my experience, you know, so. One thing I think is interesting, too, is that you also edit these films, right? Yeah. You edit, so you not only direct the film, mm -hmm. but you take all that footage and you cut it together and you put effects and, and yeah. certain things on them as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did all the post work on this music video. And how long, how long did this video take you to, to make? Um, from like kind conception, of inception? Yeah. Yeah. From, well, I mean, we got hired in... Uh, and they they raised their uh, the bulk of the money for the video on Kickstarter, so however long that took. But after that, you know, it was probably a couple weeks of post production. I mean, we're working on some other things at the same time too, so it wasn't just like our sole focus. Yeah. And then we shot two days. Um, there was there was like a week of solid pre production. We shot for two days, and then there was you know three weeks of editing and and post production work on it. You know, color timing and you know. Uh, did some uh, digital effects. I mean, uh, someone, I don't want to give it away. But, yeah. <laughs> we should just watch it. Everybody, yeah. check this out. It's awesome. And it's by, the, the, the band is by Super Black Market? Yeah. Okay. band is Super Black Market. All right. Yes. Here we go.
We sit and smoke while the room is on fire. Use your So a completely, a complete switch from like film scoring to directing. This is an yeah. awesome video. And we were actually talking. Um, those of you that are that are watching, you can see the rest of this. We'll post later. It's on on YouTube. And there's a scene where all the band members end up. You know, they start dropping, but all these zombies start attacking them. And then the lead singer, I think it's the lead singer, right? Yeah. He gets his like brains eaten out by a zombie. And you like, literally see the brains. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like, a zombie love story, though. It has a happy ending. It does. It's, it's, yeah. It does have a happy ending. There's a payoff. And it, it's pretty awesome. But, like, I mean, the, the zombie effects are pretty rad. Like, yeah. how did you do the blood and the, like, well, the, did so, you have pumps and things like yeah, that? Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And there's some of it, there's a little bit of digital stuff. I had to teach myself how to do the digital blood and stuff for this. Um, but you How know. did you do the digital, like, after effects? Or did yeah, you, well, it's like, yeah, it's like, you, you know, you key the, you know, you have, like, pre-keyed blood stuff and you it's cool. just layer it on top. How much money did you raise? For how, what was the budget? They raised the probably about $6,000 mm -hmm. for that. So it was a pretty low budget video. We got a lot of bang for our just buck. Beg. It just yeah. looks great. So. I mean, it does look great. If you film it on the can, did you film on Canon? 5D, yeah. 5D? Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, so again, guys, check it out on YouTube. We'll have all this stuff after the show. The song's called I Won't Forget You if you can't wait. Super Black Market <laughs> and Super Black Market are they on a label or do you know? I don't think so. No, I mean they're, they're unsigned, kind of. Yeah, like they're an unsigned band. They just they had, they had seen some of our work and and hit us up. You know. So how, how often does that happen? Like how often do bands happens, kind of ha happens? You know, quite a bit. We don't always take the gigs because yeah, you know. Six, did 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 you get paid or? <laughs> yeah, we got paid a okay, little bit. I mean, we, we, you know, I mean, outside of the we got paid a little bit. I mean, it was this was more of a labor of love. I mean, you know, my brother and I have a production company. Two of the guys, the guys that founded this band, they're brothers. They're from the Midwest. You know, there's a, they were cool guys. We liked them a lot and. And you know they were really earnest, and you know, and my brother and I both love zombies. So and zombies, zombies are awesome. very cool. So it gave us a chance to, you know, you know, have, have some fun. Blood. And guts did you and know? Things. Did they know it was going to be a zombie? I mean, they yeah, knew, yeah. Right? I mean, they came to us and they were like, "We want to make a zombie video," and then we w sat with them and we worked out ideas for it and then shot it. You know. Um, so one thing. I think we should talk about, since it's rather recent, which is kind mm -hmm. of on the opposite spectrum, is um, Mechanical Bride. Oh, which cool, yeah. Which recently came out mm -hmm. um, as a documentary. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that project and, and how you um, kind of got involved with... Yeah. It's, it's done by Allison Dufresne. Allison Dufresne. And she is a... Is she an anthropologist? 
she is an academic. I'm not exactly sure. I think she's an anthropologist, anthropologist. or she's she, in sociology she's at, uh, or something. She's smart. Occidental. Very <laughs> smart. I mean, Very she's smart. smart. Yes, yeah, smarter than me. But, you know, <laughs> much smarter than me. Uh, but you know, it's funny. She's also a filmmaker, and I met her when I, my very first short film screened at the Coney Island Film Festival. It, it, you know, and it was and it won like best experimental film. It's kind of what got me in all this trouble. But uh, she had a film, a short film there at the same time, and, and that's kind of how we met. And then, you know, she's been working on this documentary for like six years or seven years. And, and the documentary explores the relationships between of sex dolls, right? The industry yeah. of sex dolls. Yeah, I mean, you know, world. a lot of it has to do with men and real dolls, you know. But then it also, it, she gets into, you know, it's, it's very As smart movie. As opposed to fake dolls? Or well, real you? dolls is a, is a specific kind okay. of sex doll. I need to see this documentary. Sort of like, you know, they made the movie Lars and the Real right. Doll. Or mm -hmm. Lars right, right, yeah. right, right, right. But that's right. what it is. Mm -hmm. It's like that. And, and so, you know, the, but she's basically exploring what, you know, uh, the impulse that men yeah. have to create their own women mm -hmm. and where does that come from and, and you know and the sort of like historical underpinnings of all of that stuff let's check out the trailer because I think it's it actually looks I, I really want to see the film I've been yeah. like dying to see it um, yeah. but it kind of explores what you're talking about this whole social you know, this whole social element of like the sex doll industry yeah but it also features your music which I think yeah. will give a good preview to the audience that, that's watching or listening now so let's check out this um, trailer to mechanical bride Since the beginning of history, man has used whatever tools he had to construct ideal images of women and then imagined what it would be like to bring those images to life. Would it be all that he desired? Or would there be unanticipated surprises? This is a look inside the world of those who are now finding out. How does one love something that is not alive? love gadgets and structured things and, and uh, something that they, they can control. someone does try to create the perfect woman, you have to wonder why they're not satisfied with the women who exist already. People are strange and weird. Yeah, really crazy, and it seems yeah. like they're, I mean, one thing about the score, and again, you guys, if if you like that sound, you can definitely check out the entire score. It's a lot of music on the score. A ton like of music. 47 tracks on it, I yeah. think, on the soundtrack. Um, and it's all over, I mean, the compositional style of it's like... All over the map. All yeah. over the map. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, like, where, I mean, were you approached with a specific idea in mind? Like, obviously, these women are all robots. Yeah. Was well, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, in the score, even though it's not a thematic score, um, there's kind of a thematic idea, which is like uh, throughout the whole score, there are 
women's voices in the, in the music. I had a lot of women come in and sing on the score. And some of it, we wrote some songs for the film. And then also, you know, like you heard in there, there was uh, a couple of different women singing on, those are two different cues. But, uh, and so, because to me, that was like sort of the, the one character that doesn't have a voice in this movie are the dolls. So mm -hmm. that was kind of like the voice of the dolls kind of, you know, soaking through in the score or peeking through. and. And then also there's this other element where I used a lot of sort of uh, mechanical instruments or things that kind of sound like mechanical instruments, like automaton style instruments uh, to, you know, create the score to kind of mirror this kind of like clockwork woman idea. And you, you yourself are a collector of instruments. Do you? Yeah. So talk a little bit about that, because I know that you brought some. Yeah, I, I brought know a that, couple of things. And I know yeah, that, that um, used on the score. One of these, I think, this one yeah. relates to the score to the Mechanical Bride, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually, I mean, it's in the trailer, the very beginning. You know, the little music box sound. That's actually what this is. This is a, a programmable music box that works almost like a like a player piano, Here. where you like you take a. Uh, Here we check that out. So you can rot rotate that. Yeah. You take a, a piece of paper, it's all diatonic, of course, which makes it kind of challenging, but... Uh, it's like those old Fortran statements, like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like something from, like, a, like Dr. No or yeah, something, exactly. but, you know... <laughs> like Star uh, Trek or something. Yeah, exactly, you know. Uh, but you go through and you punch out each individual note with a little hole punch, that, and, and uh, you know, you just you run it through, and I recorded it and layered some so, voices on top. So and, is is there... Oh, I see. Corresponding chords on top. So let me yeah. see if I can mm -hmm. hold this up. So I don't know if that's going to be in. You can see that it's just like a bunch of holes, but but on here, on the on the axis are like actual. It's like the treble clef. Yeah, I mean they they, the, they put a little the uh, bass clef. Bass clef, yeah. I mean, but it's again, it's all diatonic. It'd be like using only the white keys on the piano. So. You know, you're somewhat limited, mm -hmm. so it's it's a challenge. Well, it's an old technology. So. It is very old technology. <laughs> although you could make one chromatically, I think. But, yeah. But anyway, so that was my idea. Was you where know, do you where, where do you find this? Where do you buy? Like, where do you get this? Where I you... found this actually. It was a company in England that made this, and uh, I don't know if they still make it or not. But you know, and they I provide it down. the yeah, they little... provide. I still have like a handful left of the, of Just the piano roll stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, like these, what are they normally like? What are they used for? Like, I what, mean, it's just you just know, it's like a novelty thing. You I know, see. you buy it and and you punch the holes. And actually, I mean, I've seen for a while they were selling something similar at Urban Outfitters, but but it was like only had like a like an octave or something. You know, it was really not a very useful thing other than doing little cute melodies. So can you can you demo just yeah, a, sure. a quick demo yeah. of it? So let's see. Uh, hopefully it'll you'll be able to hear it. You know, you need it on a solid surface. Uh, can I pull this back? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to uh, you know, sort of amplify the sound. But uh, so here it goes. I like that little note at the yeah. end. Very cool. <laughs> the little exclamation point. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's cool, right? That's totally awesome. And so it was uh, you know, it was just kind of a cool idea. So so it I mean you're right, it does kind of give you an idea of mechanic the mechanical robot yeah. element of the dolls. And also it played underneath the Melies film that you saw in the trailer. That's in the movie. I mean and uh, I mean, the trailer is essentially the beginning of the movie with some scenes kind of cut in, mm -hmm. you know. It, it, and is there any way, are they, is she going to release it? Any point? Well, I mean, it's doing the festival thing right now. Oh, I mean, so it still, just it premiered okay. at Hot Docs like less than a month ago and was very well received, actually. And, and then it uh, went to some festival in, in London. And I, I don't, I'm, they have a sales company, so hopefully something cool happens yeah. with it. And, you know, it's gotten great press. I mean, Wired wrote a two-page article mm -hmm. about it and stuff. It's, you know, so. I mean, it's an interesting industry that nobody really knows anything about, and it seems yeah. like a huge industry as well. Yeah. yeah. That makes a ton of money, yeah. <laughs> obviously. I mean, <laughs> they're making these dolls to be, like, so human-like that yeah, people have totally. collections of them. And it's a pretty, I mean, well, obviously, it's a very smart movie, and Allison's a very smart person, very cool, and I really hope it does well, you know. 
Well, one thing I want to do is just just play a quick 30 seconds of the opening of the score so you can get an idea of what the music actually sounds like. And again, you can check this out on Spotify, but if you're looking for better versions, you can buy them from 2-in-1 Records, which which I recommend because they're, they're... I mean, it goes from, like, thematic orchestra-type sound to yeah. ambient sounds to almost techno yeah, you know, sounds so. It's the range of the movie frequency. goes all over the world, and you go to all these different places. So you know, and and like some really different kinds of characters, like some very sympathetic people, and some very kind of odd characters that are kind of a little creepy. So you know, you have to sort of match the sounds. Match, yeah. yeah, match it, match the characters. With well, the you know, I'm gonna play the opening, and then I might skip to a couple of more tracks. Um, so let's check it out. Let's listen to it. Okay, so Mechanical Bride, awesome score, and I don't know if you guys were listening, but what what um, Rich just played on the instrument that he brought, um, we heard on the first track, yeah, the title track, which the is like track. really yeah. cool. <laughs> um, definitely check it out on the Spotify if you get a chance, and of course all these links will be up on our website when we're done, so you can either buy it or listen to Spotify, whatever you want. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your experimental films. Because um, you. you do do stop motion, you do stop motion, yeah, as well. Um, was that your fir- you said that was your first film that you submitted to festivals? Well, that got- yeah, it was like an experimental animation and all that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, growing up, I always loved animation, and then when I, you know when I uh, was older, I discovered guys like the Brothers Quay and Young Spankmeyer and you know animators like that, and I just I love that stuff and. I'll, I'll even try to incorporate it in, in the sort of narrative stuff we do if, we, if I can, you know. Incorporate it how? Just like in terms of the way, like like no. a time lapse type? Well, of? no, not necessarily. Like, I mean, I mean, you've seen the film we did, the Chrysalis film. Yes. And at the end, like the woman's all bound up and her chest sort of rips up. open and yeah. you go inside of it. And uh, I mean, we did all that with, we built a big giant armature and, and did it, you know, animated it and all that. So if I can, I'll work it in. I just, I like it. I like all things sort of lo-fi and old timey and squeaky and creaky and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Luddite or something <laughs> at heart, you know, even though I have to work with all this technology. Even though you have to work with all the technology. Well, that's good because I feel like it brings kind of a more <laughs> natural element to it, a yeah. more real element to it. Even if you film something digitally mm-hmm. and in post-production bring all of those elements in, like Jesse said, yeah. like it looks like you drag it through sand. Yeah. You know, it's like 
you know, if you add those elements in, it just gives it so, like another for sure. texture for sure. that most digital films don't have nowadays. I mean, obviously, if you're doing a music video mm -hmm. and it has to be polished looking, you've got to yeah, do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but is there any time as a director where you're just like, you really want it to be like dirty and like, you know, you want it to be pushed to the limit mm -hmm. in terms of its look, but like you just can't because... Yeah. Well, every single time, you know, but, you, know, <laughs> no, like, you know, yeah, you're usually, you know, usually people want something that looks very slick and very clean and stuff and, and we, we do that and, you know. And that's true for your composing days too, when you compose for the studio, I'm sure it was like for really sure. tough. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of times people want stuff that's really clean and, 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 and uh, you know, kind of current sounding and stuff and that's cool and I mean and I like a lot of music like that and I, I don't have a problem doing that kind of stuff but you know I like you know I like things to be a little more organic and a little more have a little more what I consider to be sort of like life to them a little more analog a little more warm let's talk about let's let's play a clip from Sandman actually because okay. I feel like Sandman is, is Sandman the 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 video that won the award? No, it was the one called Into Something Rich and Strange. That was, well, I mean, the Sandman's won some awards and stuff too, and is actually, you know, like, people, you know, it's this Freudian thing, and we keep getting requests from academics to use it in their classes. Really? It's, it's so weird, mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, we, we should, um, let them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're just You're like, yeah. anybody out there, I mean, the Sandman's done, it, its life is, 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 is kind of, it's lived a full life, so mm -hmm. it's like, if you want it, it's yours. You know? That's cool. That's really cool. And, um, you know, you guys, if you uh, are watching right now, if you want to see all of Rich's work, go, go to their website. It's actually pretty great. It has all their stuff on it. K&R-Productions.com has all of his music videos and experimental work. And um, I'll do my best to put as much as I can on Triglo when we're, when we're finished so you can watch them too. But let's check out the first minute or so of Sandman so you can get an idea mm -hmm. of, um, of, of Rich's stop motion. Um, work and it's also mixed with live action. Yeah, too, I mean right? it's mostly live action. There's only a little bit of stop motion, in and it's it, the but it's the, like the hands coming up. Okay. And there's you know, any there's an automaton girl, and anytime you sort of see her by herself, it was actually done with the the what they call pixelation technique, where it's like stop motion with the human being. You know, where they just you have them move a little bit, move and then a you take bit. a yeah, photo. You take a photo. Yeah, that's cool. All right, let's ch let's check it out. There we go. So again, this is about, how long is this? This is about, oops. Yeah. It's about five minutes or so. I just went into the Charo backstory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have all these on a playlist, so it's like if it stops, yeah, yeah. it just starts going to the next one. 
Um, it's about five minutes. So how long did that? I mean, how long did that project take you? Um, we actually shot it all, with the exception of the, some of the animation, in a day, and then it was post production. Very post heavy thing, but you know, it was done very quickly, really. So, one thing that I'm curious about, and I think that we're kind of getting from from talking to you, is that you you kind of have your hands on a lot of different things. You mm -hmm. either do composing, or you're directing music videos, or um, you're being a director, you're putting mm -hmm. your director hat, or you're be putting your composer hat on, but you're also putting your artist, experimental filmmaker, trying out new stuff. Yeah. And is this something that, like, do you wake up one day and you're like, okay, I gotta make an experimental film, or do you kind of, like, when you work on a project, do you, are you like, all right, I need to change a pace, and, you know, I'm done with composing for a while, or do you always kind of just, like, try to do everything at the same time? Uh, I just try to stay busy, but, um... You know, it's just sometimes you have an idea and there's no project for it. <laughs> so you make a project for an idea. Um, you know, and a lot of times with music videos or whatever, they allow you to use techniques that you've kind of come up with or you want to experiment with. I mean, it's kind of the cool thing about music videos and uh, they're short form and, you know, they're... It's kind of like the last frontier of an experimental film right now. Really, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, and people will watch a lot of, like, really weird stuff in a music video because, you know, they like the music. Um, uh, so, I don't know, you know, but like we started, we made these films, they were just experiments, uh, but recently where it was like we went out and shot a bunch of stuff on Super 8 millimeter, and then took the film home and processed it using like coffee and orange juice and stuff in a closet as opposed to taking it to a lab. And it just, it looks like you found it in like D.W. Griffith's yeah. dumpster, <laughs> you know, it, it just looks so awesome, you know, but uh you, you know, so and then do you digitize it to edit yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, digitized it and mm -hmm. edited it. And we showed them as part of like an art installation uh, about a year ago. Is that your yeah. Venice Beach? Yeah, you, like there that. was one about Venice Beach and there was one where we went to this abandoned amusement park and sort of, you know, that I mean, I mean cool. not amusement park, like a golf, uh, abandoned miniature golf miniature course. Miniature golf, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was just all these like kind of weird uh, images of, of, you know, this sort of decaying sort of place where kids used to go have a lot of fun shot in this way that looked like some sort of bizarre archival thing. Let's um, let's show the audience just about 15 or 20 seconds of this. And uh, this is the mini golf in the land of the dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the land yeah. of the dead. So and it's it was actually in inspired awesome. by a poem called Ozymandias, which <laughs> if you want to look it up, it's pretty cool. Cool. Let's check it out. Here we go. That was done with coffee. Yeah, you, you developed it was it with like coffee. actual film. You know, people forget what that looks like. I know. But yeah, we shot some film and then developed it. You know, using yeah, coffee. No dark room. You just went into a dark like yeah. bathroom. Yeah, and it was on Super 8, so they had those cartridges, and we smashed them open with a hammer and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like you know, we just, the film had to be punished or something. <laughs> well, it looks really awesome, and yeah. um, I, I think that normally people wouldn't expect. Like a film to be able to like be seen if you process it with like coffee beans and yeah. orange juice. Yeah, but it was just that was like you know it was a technique we wanted to try out, and then we got to do these sort of installation videos, uh, and so you know we shot these things and they're cool. You know, do you does that technique? Do you apply it to like um, when you make a mu music video, for example? Do you can you say it just gives you more tools mm -hmm. to be able to? Sure. I mean, well, you know, I would use it for a music video for sure. I mean, there's actually a feature film that we're developing right now, a horror film. My brother and I were developing, and there's a portion of the film that's going to be shot that way. You know, sort of like when we saw the old El Charo backstory thing. I mean, that was me just trying to figure out how to sort of emulate this silent film thing in a sort of experimental way. And I think we're going to use at least this technique at least a little bit in the film. You know? That's cool. That's so. really cool. So you just keep you just keep busy as busy as possible, yeah. kind of taking as much in and yeah. experimenting when you can. Exactly, and just just always trying new things. You know, yeah. And the same awesome. with the music and stuff. I mean, I'm always trying to kind of collect like little weird instruments and stuff. But you know, my main focus lately has been 
you know, making films. Making uh, films. And we've been doing some stuff, like some TV pilots and stuff too, and that stuff's very straight, so you don't get a lot of... You don't, don't get chance. a lot of, like, freedom to yeah. experiment. So then we get to go off and do these little weirdo projects that, you know... You know, all your Passion little, project. all yeah. your little art film friends will like, but you know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's switch gears and talk about another recent thing that you've done, which is Giant Mechanical Man, which has just mm -hmm. been released. Yeah, you've done the the music for it. Yeah, and again, you wrote a ton of music. I remember seeing all of the cues that you'd written. It yeah, was we, like, I wrote a lot of music for it. Like, know. and what is a lot of music for, like, in general? Well, I mean, ultimately, what's in the film is probably about a you know standard amount of music for the film but it took a while to kind of find the right tone i mean you know the movie they shot it in detroit and it's a very sad looking place now i mean there's just nobody there i've heard stories about that and um and when we first started working on the music lee kirk is the director and he's a super talented really cool guy and uh we were working on the music and i was reacting to the imagery you know and and and, and you know it's kind of a it's a romantic comedy sort of film but it's it's very sad and the characters are having a tough time at, you know like they're all he's very indie movie kind of trying to find themselves sort of thing and so i'm reacting to all of this and the music you know they, they kept coming back to me being like man this music's too sad <laughs> this music's too sad you know people are going to leave depressed yeah, exactly so it took a long time to kind of once once we we sort of found uh the the right tone. It didn't take that long to write, but there was a lot of music written in the beginning, and it was a, it was definitely a different kind of score for me too, because Lee and I like a lot of the same kind of like rock music. And what kind of rock? What kind of rock music did were you guys? Well, we sort of bonded over like Mogwai and Explosions in the Sky and Sugaros and and bands like that. You know, kind of post rock, what they used to call post rock kind of stuff. Yeah, and indie. There's a lot of like kind of indie rock, and they licensed a good bit of music for the film. Actually, there is there's a Mogwai song at the beginning of the film. That's cool. So, um, and when we recorded the music. You know, I tried to record it more like a rock record and less like a film score because, you know, there's going to be this licensed music. And it's something that always kind of bugs me in these kind of indie movies is like you're watching them and it's like they have this song that's by, you know, Modest Mouse or something. And then you get this cue and it just so obviously sounds like film music relative to the, right. you know, even though they're trying to kind of emulate it, you know, and it'll have like acoustic guitars and little bells and stuff. But it. It, you know, it just, it doesn't have, the, so we tried to record it like a rock record and even mastered it and, uh, you know, uh, before, you know, a lot of times, you, you know, you put the score in the movie, then when you're done, you master it and stuff. We did the other way around. So, it, so the hope was that the license or that the, the score would almost sound like, like you licensed them from a post-rock group or right, something. Right, that's interesting. And, and in some cases, we didn't use the mastered version of the track, you know, where, you know, where it needed to be a little more dynamic, but... So would you say that post rock? Um, I mean, because you used kind of like a post rock influence in your other score. Nicole oh yeah, Children for sure. As well. So I mean, you you've listened to this to oh, yeah. a lot of. of and that, that was like a very yeah. I was really at that time, and still am. But at that time, I was really into like Silver Mount Zion and Godspeed You Black Emperor and stuff like that. And so and that was that really influenced that kind of music. So you sent us um, a few cues yeah. from Giant Mechanical Man, which hasn't been released, right? Uh, the score has not been Oh, the released. score hasn't been released yet. Hasn't no, been no. released yet. The, the film is available. You um, can see it. And are, is there a VA soundtrack? Are they releasing a soundtrack for the music? Like the? I don't... I, well, you know, we, we're talking about it, but uh, we haven't decided whether or not we're going to put out a film, uh, uh, a, a score with... One of the producers has a record label. Oh, cool. So. Very, very cool. Well, um... Let's check out some of these clips. I think maybe we should start with eviction. Yeah, that's um, it. It kind of gives. I think it probably will set the tone of yeah. what's going on in the movie. Yeah, I this is one of my sadder cues that kind of actually made it into the film. Really, they <laughs> so, weren't like too sad by it. They weren't yeah. like well, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and th actually, if you uh, the trailer's on iTunes, so if you want to check out the trailer, it's definitely there. And there was actually mentioned before the show that the film is on. It's on demand, right? It's on on demand, and I think on iTunes, and it showed theatrically. Like, I mean, it premiered at Tribeca a couple weeks ago, and Tribeca bought it, and they put it. I don't know, you know, they have this deal with like uh, Time, Time Warner, Warner, I think, yeah, yeah, with for on demand, and then I think you can get it on iTunes, and I imagine it'll be on some sort of disc media at some point soon. Yeah, uh, at some point, angle. yeah, yeah probably in point. a couple months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what what what's up with that but i know that it, it is available to you can watch it now if you want cool all right let's check out this cue called eviction 
And again, it is from the unreleased score to Giant Mechanical Man, which was just released a few weeks ago. Here we go. Okay, again, the score for Giant Mechanical Man by Rich Ragsdale, awesome cue, yeah. very beautiful. And you were saying something really cool about how it was a rock cello. That you yeah, the girl that played the cello is, you know, she plays in like bands and stuff. It's not like a like a Classical session cellist. player. Yeah, like you know, so that it, you know, the idea was to make it sound like you know some some kids playing over at the Smell or something, and not you know some like really nice classically trained cellist. So. So you you said that this was one of your like sadder cues, like this is one that, of your. That's one of the more dour cues. Although I mean, you know, the score is not like you know super happy. I mean, there's some, <laughs> we wrote some songs for this score. You know, I actually wrote one that the director Lee Kirk sang in the in the film. You know, and uh, and that's the one we were hearing, but in the pre-show, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and the it's this one. I, I've, got, I've a got a problem. Let's yeah. play like 15 seconds of it. Yeah. Here we go. Roll down the block to your house. I got a problem with my feet. They like to run down the street. So that's the director. That's the director, yeah. And he, he's married to the lead in the film is Jenna Fisher from The Office. And he's got a lot of, it's got a great cast. I mean, it's a really good cast. And it's, it's, a, it's a really good sort of, you know, movie. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that um, those of you watching, definitely rent it. Check it out on demand if you have cable. I don't have cable, unfortunately. <laughs> so I probably won't be able to see it. <laughs> I know, I'm like living in, in, in the past here. Um, or the future. Or the future, right. Because cable is going to be obsolete, I guess, when the new Apple TV comes out, whenever that comes out. Yeah. But anyway, so um, you brought a second instrument. Before we go, because we're running out of time, um, I would want to definitely talk about this really quickly. So yeah. what, what is this? Well, uh, you know, you'd ask, I bring a couple of my weirdo instruments in, and this is a marxophone. It's a, you know, early 20th century instrument, maybe late 19th century. And uh, I used it on a score for that uh, television show, Masters of Horror. 
that was the black cat. Yeah, the black cat. It was based on Edgar Allan Poe, and so we wanted to use like some period instruments and stuff. And uh, uh, Stuart Gordon directed it, the guy from Reanimator, that had directed Reanimator, among other things. And uh, and so you know, I used it on the score, and it's kind of like a a weird squeaky creaky lo-fi kind can of thing. Can you hold it up so people can see? Like it's it is it's like a string instrument. Yeah, it's kind of like um, there we go. I don't know, like a like a zither. Or almost like a uh, auto like harp, a... you know, but you play it with hammers, so it's almost like a cross between a piano and a hammered dulcimer and a auto harp, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. So can so, you can you yeah. just demo so like, a, like like what it sounds like? You know, so if you hold it totally the, sounds like Edgar Allan Poe. Totally, and if you <laughs> hold the note down, it you know it tremolos, you know, so it's like. Or you can just hit it once, you know, so and you can play chords and all that. So. That's pretty awesome. So do you spend a lot of time recording these sounds so that you have like a big sample library? No, I mean, you know, I, I played it on the score. You played I, mean, it I, live. Did, I didn't like sample it or anything. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I mean, because part of the charm is, you know, listen, you hear the hammers like hit the back of the, the thing. Echo, and yeah. All the little like weird nuances that you get that. If you were to sample it, you know, you'd have to like really do it, deep sample it and stuff to get all that kind of cool stuff. To get like the effects and things yeah. like that. And you know, I mean, that's the 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 one the downside of like using samples and stuff is that, you know, you know, there's a sort of sameness to uh, to all the all the notes, you know, because they, they they try to record everything and make it sound really nice, really good. Yeah. And you know, you lose those little weird. You know, kind nuances. of nuances, just sort of accidental kind of accidental weird mistakes things. that sound really good. Yeah, like. yeah, exactly. <laughs> things that a long time ago people tried really hard to, to, get, to rid of. get rid of. And it's like even like on that cue we listened to from Giant Mechanical Man, it's like there was a sixty cycle hum coming out of the amp, and I just left it. I was like, you know, whatever, because everybody plugs their guitar straight into Pro Tools now, and so it's just like you lose all that kind of stuff. It's just know? super clean. It's yeah, like it's way exactly too super clean. clean. So it's like you know. I'm gonna, it's like, look, this is a real amp. I swear. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, what's what's on the horizon? Like, what are you what are you looking for to do next? Like, what's is there anything oh. that you're interested in? In well, my brother and I, you know, with our production company, we have, uh, you know, several movies we're trying to get off the ground. One of which <clears throat> I'm going to direct, and um, in the meantime, we're doing music videos and television pilots and whatever else kind of comes our way. And the same with music. I mean, there's a couple of films that I've talked to some people about scoring. I don't know if it's going to happen yet or not. You know, you know. But uh, you know, my I haven't really tried to get composing work in a while. It just comes and I do it. People kind of just approach you. Yeah, with exactly. Projects. So, um, so we'll see. I mean, you know, again, it's like our focus with our production company is mostly features, and you know, we do the music videos and television work to kind of pay the bills right you know, keep the lights on well rich i wish we could talk for another hour about your other music and in fact if you guys go on spotify um check him out just do a search for rich ragsdale and there's a number of his scores on there including big river man which i wanted to talk about today but is a fantastic score as well um that's really interesting it has a whole interesting story to it <laughs> that <laughs> that's actually a really awesome documentary too it, it's yeah, it's a very cool movie pretty awesome documentary about a guy who is kind of like considered to be like the last superhero who swims down the Amazon to raise awareness for, for global warming. Global warming. But it basically, but it's like, it's like nuts. heart of darkness. He just goes insane. By he the goes end. insane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the music, the music that goes with it is actually very in tune with his. Like you really get into his mind as a result of the score. And I think some people were saying, in fact, that like were, there were reviews about the score for for yeah. for Big Bird Man saying it was like best thing to, to be heard in a theater and like yeah. just really big and amazing for a documentary so those of you watching definitely check him out online on um, Facebook and um, check us out on our Facebook page we'll have all the stuff up there including trig.la and if you are a composer or a fan or somebody who has questions for Jesse and I if you're a band or something or somebody that's interested in film scoring contact us through trig.la go to film tracks and um, it'll email directly to us, and we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about on the show, if it's interesting enough for us, right? Yeah. Hopefully. It's got to be good. Hopefully. It's so good. anyway, Rich, thanks so much for coming wow, on the show. Thank you for having me. You'll it have was a to lot come, of fun. You'll have to come again. Wow. And those of you watching, stay tuned. Next week we'll have a great show. 
Find us on Facebook. Go to iTunes and subscribe so that you don't ever miss a show if you can't make it to the live show. We will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. <laughs>